This is Epicenter, episode 367 with guest Juan Benet. Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks Apple. And if you're new to the show and not already subscribed, you can find Epicenter on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Today, our guest is Juan Benet. He is the founder and CEO of Protocol Labs. Of course, that's the organization that's behind the IPFS project and Filecoin. Now, longtime listeners of the show will remember our interview with Juan, which was about five years ago. It was on episode 100. And I remember recording that interview and being so inspired by the idea of IPFS. First, by this concept of a fully decentralized, always available content and file storage platform, but also the notion of flipping the client server model on its head. And rather than thinking of content as hosted on a server with an address, you address that content directly by its hash. And of course, IPFS also has built in versioning. At the time, all these ideas were very new, and I think that they've contributed a lot to how we think about decentralized storage. And in some ways, they've set standards for decentralized cloud storage infrastructure and the functions that we expect from them. Of course, IPFS has been immensely valuable to the ecosystem as one of the building blocks for Web3 and DeFi. It's an integral part of many projects in the space. But IBFS was just one part of the broader stack, and the economic model had yet to be built. And that, of course, is Filecoin. Since we recorded our last interview, there was, of course, the Filecoin ICO. That project was built out and is now live. So Juan is back on the show to give us an update. And it was such an important conversation, and there was so many things to cover that we're releasing it as a two-part episode. Part one will focus on IPFS and the vision for a fully decentralized cloud storage infrastructure. And part two, which is coming out next week, will focus more on Filecoin. A little bit of housekeeping. As you know, I'm part of the ADAN team. That's the Association for the Development of Digital Assets. We had the president, Simon Polaro, on a couple of weeks ago to talk about the upcoming Mika regulation in Europe. ADAN is hosting a free webinar where you can learn all about the French crypto regulatory framework. France is a great place to live, and it's a great place to run a business. In fact, I live here. I started companies here as well. And the French regulatory framework is very favorable to crypto startups. There are over 100 established crypto companies in France, and many of them have benefited from the ICO visa that is issued by the French Financial Markets Authority. So if you want to join that webinar and learn how to build a thriving crypto business in France, it's happening on December 8th, and you can register for free by going to epicenter.rocks slash A-D-A-N. Speaking of Adan, we're actually building a brand new website on WordPress. And what's perhaps been the most time-consuming and frustrating is everything that relates to DevOps. So I mean deployment, maintenance, backups, and database management. Well, the WordPress toolkit for cPanel is a tool that makes it easy for developers to manage their WordPress infrastructure. I'll tell you a little bit more about that during the interview. And a couple of weeks ago, our friends at Algorand hosted a great webinar to help developers build sophisticated DeFi apps. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like that, I think you'll love their After Hours series where blockchain developers can meet with their team and members of the community for informal conversations about Algorand. I'll also tell you a little bit more about that later on. But for now, here's part one of our conversation with Juan Benet. Hi, and we're here with Juan Benet. He's the founder of Protocol Labs and of Filecoin and of IPFS. And this is the second time we have Juan on. He's actually been on before on episode 100. So a long time ago, so it's about five years ago. And back then we spoke about IPFS and we spoke about Filecoin as well. I mean, the uh, white paper was out and, you know, the kind of vision of Filecoin existed. 
And actually, I remember this was an, it was an awesome episode. It was like one of our, my favorite episodes. And we ended up, at some point, we ended up having like being short an episode. And then I think we rebroadcast the, the episode we had with Juan. So, but now we have him on again. And, you know, a long time has passed. And Filecoin's actually live. And there's been a huge amount of progress and this kind of this new burgeoning ecosystem arising there. So, yeah, we're really excited to have Juan on and dive into Filecoin and, yeah, what's going on there. So thanks so much for joining us. Hey, thank you so much for having me. Uh, last time was a blast. Uh, one of my favorite conversations ever. So uh, really excited for, uh, for today and, uh, yeah, looking forward to it. Cool, awesome. One of the things I remember when we spoke last time, you spoke quite a bit about Bell Labs and kind of like how that organization has inspired you in terms of like how you're approaching uh, protocol labs and you know now a lot of time has passed and like you know protocol apps has grown a lot too so i'm curious like how has that played out and you know how have you kind of continued pursuing this idea of and this model of bell labs you know it's been uh, a huge inspiration for uh for us and for a number of people that that um that work at protocol apps uh to kind of create a a an organization that can do research and development for foundational technology um, in the long term. Uh, it is a thing to aspire to. I mean, you know, building something of the nature of, of the labs is like a multi-decade project. You know, the kind of, that kind of institution takes 20, 30 years to build. We, we think that we are uh, on the path to creating a really important lab uh, for the world. And I think we've been doing um, pretty significant research and development across a variety of topics. And we think that, that we're kind of on a good trajectory, but, you know, very, very, very far away from anything close to something as amazing as, as Bell Labs, of course. But, you know, it, it's been a very, very important inspiration for how we structured the organization and how we think about uh, hiring and how we think about goal setting and uh, the structuring of problems. And, you know, if you think about going from fundamental scientific development all the way to, you know, prototyping um, you know, getting to a to a, an important result, then taking that result and uh, thinking about what kind of technology can be built with it, um, to then prototyping the technology, getting through multiple cycle cycles of development before you can reach something remotely close to product, and then from there, kind of building a thing and 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 shipping it to the world. Sort of innovating is a long kind of uh, cycle of of going through and iterating through through those uh, through that pipeline, and we've structured protocol labs. Uh, as an organization to to take that um, kind of a, from a first principles perspective, like think about carefully, think about every stage of development with every piece of technology that we're working on, and think about all the different artifacts that are made along the way, and try to make those open source. So think of um, things like the ideas that feed into the research, uh, get, getting documenting all of that and putting it into an easily accessible. Uh, medium, then, you know, the actual results, uh, making sure to publish all of those, then from those results going to, um, you know, intermediate uh, prototypes and so on, open sourcing all the code for those. And then um, once you actually get into into building out a system, like making that um, a dependable piece of technology. And so that's something that, that we think we're doing that uh, definitely other labs from the past didn't do, which is embrace open source fully and, and build things that where every single intermediate stage of research and development is, is usable by, by other people. You know, one of the important things that a, any of these kinds of important labs end up having to do is be able to innovate on multiple front, fronts at once uh, because the innovation cycles are quite long. You know, they, they take on the order of three to 10 years on each individual piece of technology. You, um, you want to be able to kind of innovate on multiple fronts at the same time. And so that means you have to get extremely good at road mapping across all of these different problems and think about resource allocation against that and who's going to work on what problem and for what duration. And then think about um, then like what projects and problems you're building and kind of getting to uh, over time. So all of that has been a you know, phenomenal um, uh, challenge for us. And we've been, uh, you know, now have worked on many projects that, uh, that are kind of a getting in these different stages of development from, you know, starting, we started with IPFS, and then from there, um, took pieces of IPFS and, and pulled them out and made them into their own projects. Things like Lib2P and IPLD and and others, and uh, then built Filecoin, and then in the in the road to that, ended up working on other projects like DRAND uh, and so on. So, and along the way, there's been 
research done as well on the primitives and the piece of, of tech. Um, so that means a bunch of libraries got built, uh, papers got written, a lot of collaborations with other groups. So there's, there's a lot of kind of broader ecosystem development in the, the entire pipeline that, that uh, we've been you know, super thrilled to be able to do. And, and like that's been probably the most fun part of all of this for many of us has been you know, getting to being able to do all of those different pieces. And I mean, the contributions that you guys have made to the ecosystem, I mean, uh, they are foundational to a large extent. What I wonder is, um, how do you bridge the gap between running a research foundation and running a company? Be because, I mean, those two are very different beasts, right? So, yes and no, in that I think most important labs of the type of our labs, things like the labs itself, Xerox, SRI, and so on, where, and you know, even today, things like X and DeepMind and Google Brain and, and so on, a lot of these systems are corporate labs. They're corporate research labs. They're not academic labs. And there's a very important difference that happens when you can do research in an organization that can also do development and engineering, which is that you actually get to take the innovation all the way from idea to building a, a thing and getting the thing used by people um, and seeing all the problems that you're going to run into and then do all the whole innovation cycle in one in one institution, which is you know, so much very important work gets done in academia that it's very difficult to translate into, into technology that uh, people use because it ends up being kind of far removed from, uh, from users. And so there's a lot of work in, in academia that because universities traditionally are very far away removed, kind of intentionally set up that way, removed from industry and removed from, from development, a lot of important work get stuck just in the in the idea phase and just in the kind of important result phase, but not actually getting to technology. And so from that perspective, I think you have to get these corporate labs to work and they have to, in a sense, be straddling the world between research and development and be in, in you know, in the, in the past it's been sort of a corporate structure. I, I don't know that, that, a, that a company per se is the best structure for it, but, but I think neither is academia. And so there's there's a gap in between here, and there's not that many institutions that that have survived long enough to kind of create a, a class of entities for them. And so it definitely is a, a struggle. I think what one of the things you're you're getting at is when you're building a company, you have to you know, be very, very focused on kind of shorter term oriented goals and thinking about product development and um, business goals and all that kind of stuff. And that can come in significant conflict with long-term research-oriented goals. And so you have to uh, you have to get extremely good at, at understanding the priorities and why you invest deeply in something and why that longer-term oriented view is gonna is gonna be very successful for the organization long term. One of the things that helps us is Vertical Labs itself as an institution, as a company, um, is very mission-oriented and there's a very strong uh, mission. Our mission is to drive breakthroughs in computer science, drive breakthroughs in computing technology in general. And that's a, um, a, a thing that, uh, you know, everybody who works at, at PL has a strong sense that that's what PL is about. And so that helps everybody kind of straddle that boundary in, in being able to navigate that, that whole spectrum from research to development to, you know, actually building a business. Because it, if you, to really innovate and to really push a breakthrough, it's not enough to build kind of a product that's kind of in the margin and iterative. You have to do something fundamentally important, fundamentally that pushes the envelope in some in some way, and at the same time, it's not enough to come up with an idea and tell the world about it. You actually, in a, a breakthrough technology, it's not really a breakthrough until it has actually gotten adopted by the broader uh, world. And so, you know, you can think about and theorize all kinds of things, but if you haven't had a result that has transformed how the rest of the world operates, it hasn't really been a break breakthrough yet. And, uh, you know, it's funny because Bell Labs itself had a, a very strong uh, kind of meme about this. They used to describe it as you haven't innovated until you've sold it. And the idea was an innovation is not really an innovation until the fundamental improvement and result has been put into a product and sold into a market. And if you haven't done that, then the innovation hasn't really happened yet. And so having a, a very strong sense that that whole pipeline, like to, to really advance technology, to really push science forward, 
you have to think of the whole thing as an integrated system and, and not really kind of introduce a bunch of boundaries that, that, that are kind of really fuzzy in reality and to understand how to do the whole pipeline and you get good at that. That's kind of, um, that's the sweet spot. And again, we are in the early days of something, of building an institution like that. PL is about six years old now and we're, you know, it's a baby relative to any of the important labs to, to think about in the world. And so uh, maybe some, you know, we aspire to become a good institution like that someday. And, you know, with a lot of luck and a lot of hard work, we'll get there. But, uh, but yeah, we, we hope for that. I've been building WordPress websites for over 10 years, and the most frustrating thing has always been DevOps. I'm talking about deployment, maintenance, backups, and database management. I've lost so many hours of sleep doing WordPress infrastructure management. If you've been building websites for as long as I have, you're definitely familiar with cPanel. They've been providing web hosting management software for 25 years. Well, they have a new product. It's called the WordPress Toolkit for cPanel, and I've been given an opportunity to try it out. It's really cool. It makes managing your WordPress websites really easy. You can manage multiple WordPress sites from one dashboard, and you can manage users and databases too. And because all your websites are managed from a single interface, you'll be more efficient. This is really useful if you're running multiple environments like staging and production. The WordPress toolkit can also apply security settings and policies to all your sites at once so you can harden and protect your company's website. There's a free light version and a deluxe paid version that has added features like website cloning and smart updates. That's also great if you're running multiple environments. Anyway, if you're doing anything with WordPress today, I would really encourage you to check this out because it'll make your life so much easier. To learn more about the WordPress toolkit for cPanel and be informed when it comes out, go to epicenter.rocks slash cPanel. That's C-P-A-N-E-L. We'd like to thank cPanel for their support of the podcast. So you mentioned the mission and the way you phrased it was like breakthroughs in like computer science. And of course, in the in the crypto space, often people, you know, talk about mission in, you know, with like related to ideas of like decentralization or maybe some sort of like sovereignty for individuals. So like, so how, like, how do you look at the protocol last vision? Like to what extent... Like, is it, or can you explain, like, is it breakthroughs in computer science? Is there elsewhere? Or like, how is the intersection with the crypto space? Yeah, um, and I, sorry, I misspoke a little bit. I, it's breakthroughs in, in, driving breakthroughs in computing technology. And so, and the idea there is, is, uh, is that it's both the science and the technology. You have to do both the science of coming up with new results, but also you have to go and build them into a thing. And the way that this fits into the Web3 world for us is that, in this time period, in you know 2020, and probably for the last five to ten years, Web 3.0, what is now called Web 3.0, which includes kind of all the Web 3, sorry, all the crypto space plus the kind of IPFS, D Web area of things, this whole important development that's happening is a really critical part of computing. Um, and from our perspective, driving breakthroughs in this area is one of the highest leverage things that we could be doing. Uh, you know, in, in the world, because the kinds of technologies that are being put in place are upgrading the computational fabric that we all use, right? So if you think about the applications that we use day, day to day, and you think about the rights and properties that these these applications have and, and these systems that we build, um, use, and so on, and you think about the utility that crypto brings and the entire Web3 world brings uh, to the table, like that verifiability, making sure that when we enter into a transaction or when, when a contract executes and so on, uh, all of those interactions are verifiable and correct and so on. And you're not just taking it on trust and on faith from other entities. That's a fundamental computing technology improvement. And I think in general, this gets misunderstood or, or uh, sold short by kind of the broader computing world. Uh, they tend to look at crypto and Web3 as, oh, it's, you know, it's weird and like decentralization is weird and crypto is weird and like, oh, it's just about money and whatnot. But what's really going on is uh, the infrastructure layers of the internet are, we're, we're figuring out how to introduce verifiability and rights into those layers and putting in place systems that can automatically scale with the right incentive structures. And getting that right is probably going to be one of the most important transition periods for for the internet and the web in, in, in the last 20 years and probably for the next you know, 10, 15. And so this is kind of why 
working in this area is is kind of important for us. It's also a little bit incidental. Uh, when I started Protocol Labs, I was already working on IPFS and so on, so it sort of followed that pathway. But we ended up uh, discovering just so many different super rich areas for computing. Uh, it's not just files and distribution of information. It's There's all kinds of important primitives being explored here from new economies and new financial structures for organizing um, people and organizing work and new legal structures and new legal components for for uh, for how might you build groups of people and group like uh, yeah like how do you organize entity all well, the whole DAO space for example and or or uh, you know crypto first crypto native uh, organizations is incredibly interesting and it tends to be talked about much more than experimented with and so I really think we need to experiment a lot more and try a lot more things. Um, probably more than we than we talk about it, but uh, but I think it's one of the most important uh, things going on. It's it's really software eating uh, the economy, software eating law, um, and when you kind of put those th things together, the and you think of the leverage that computing gives you, it, it's an extremely uh, there's a bunch of extremely powerful primitives that are being played with right now that are probably going to define how humans operate for the next. 15, 20 years, um, and it's a lot of a lot of that is getting getting kind of yeah tinkered with today. So it's kind of like the personal computer tinkering that was happening, you know, a decade or so before uh, personal computers became kind of like the hot thing on the market. And so for us, it's like a, it's really kind of an amazing uh, field to be in because it's so rich. There's so many different areas to to kind of so many different threats to pull on, and uh, so many different possibilities that that could be. Uh, could be turn out to be really important. I think probably the um, the hard part is some some degree of prioritization and focus, so that you can actually you know work on in specific kind of discrete projects for the timeline that they need, and you don't get spread too thin, right? So uh, there's so much going on that it's very easy to kind of ac acquire a very large fringe of work and kind of make progress incrementally on all of it, but but it feels like you're going really slow because there's just uh, y your energy and effort is being divided across across that large fringe. Um, so the way that we kind of navigate that is plant specific flags uh, on specific kind of milestones, being able to achieve certain kinds of goals and then working against those those goals and focusing on them somewhat sequentially. So at Protocol Labs, you're continuously pushing boundaries and you're doing that as a sole founder. So basically in my experience, it helps enormously to have someone to bounce ideas off of and have someone equally committed um, to the same thing. Um, so being being the visionary, it's, it's actually pretty exhausting. So <laughs> um, having someone to run with makes it a lot easier because you don't you don't you end up second guessing yourself a lot, right? So basically having someone who's equally crazy helps. How has that worked out for you? Because you're currently doing this alone. I mean, not alone. I mean, you have a team, but yeah, as as a sole founder. Yeah, uh, great question. I mean, for for me specifically, you know, Protocol Labs as a team is incredibly brilliant and hardworking. So I get to work with a ton of amazingly brilliant people who are having a ton of ideas. And you know, in terms of of vision for the long term. Maybe in the early days, like in the first couple of years, uh, a lot of it was kind of shaped by me. But now um, we've kind of set up, set up the right structures such that the range of projects that we're making and the range of ideas that we're pursuing and all of that kind of stuff uh, are being driven by by the team as a whole, right? And so like that's been phenomenal. A, a really important transition for any organization is to identify the spots where uh, whoever started the organization or, or, or the leadership in general is... Um, you don't want to be overly reliant on any leader, and so you, you got to like spot those single points of failure and like remove them. And so for us, has been uh, thinking of ways to help kind of foster projects that that other people are coming up with and other people are having ideas for, and and so on. So a lot of Filecoin today is the product of like the actual technology within it and the kind of side projects uh, that that kind of help build Filecoin um, is a product of a lot of a lot of other people. And so really, you know, I get to work with with super brilliant people who are kind of helping shape that vision. Probably my role is shifting more towards, uh, and, and maybe maybe not as much in the next couple of years, but but really kind of 
further out, like maybe thinking five years ahead, um, is going to turn much more into looking further ahead and, and kind of thinking about kind of ranges of fields to work work towards and how to how to build the organizational structures to to kind of yield that kind of really good R and D that across across a variety of things. We also have kind of like a creative structure here where we think about individual projects. R- right now, the, the way that we sort of organize ourselves is that there are individual projects and those projects have a project lead and the project lead sort of defines the vision for that project in that year, right? So there's like a larger stretch of, of work that we are going after over, say, a decade, like larger scale goals like that. And then project leads and the team in the project sort of get to figure out what, what are the important goals in that year to achieve and, and so on. And that becomes kind of pretty scalable and it's a really good really good setup but now i think part of what you're getting at is uh building systems like this building companies building larger projects is an extremely difficult endeavor and and when people try it try to do it uh, alone you can get into all kinds of like difficult challenges and it super it definitely helps a lot to have uh, other people to kind of bounce ideas with uh, around with and, and all that kind of stuff uh for me i think it's been uh because for collapse is so i don't know Unique is probably the right, wrong word because everyone everyone can e- easily say that their project is super unique. Um, it's more, Profiles is so different in, in its goal set in terms of really trying to do something very long-term oriented, very R&D focused, and at the same time have short-term oriented success with specific projects. Like that, that is kind of a pretty, um, you have to, it's quite difficult to kind of, I think, find Many people, or you know, several people that together could have been super aligned over, you know, ten ten years or so to to kind of follow that path. So I think for me it's been an advantage to be to be a, a solo founder because I don't have to argue with myself uh, about like the the kind of the trajectory there. Though it, the way I think um I think being being a uh, it definitely made a bunch of things challenging in certain periods of time where you know I became very much a bottleneck or a or a point of failure for all kinds of important development for the organization. And so I think getting extremely good at identifying, you know, this advice for solo founders especially, but for really all founders and all leaders uh, of organizations, it's um, really kind of spotting where where you have your unique contributions that maybe right now are really nice and really useful, but will quickly become uh, bottlenecks and problems uh, and kind of staying trying to stay ahead of that so that you can then build that into the rest of the organization and kind of either build systems against that or recruit for it. Most of the times, the challenge becomes build a team that's better than you in every way, right? And so at every kind of scale of organization, like when you began as a single person or a small team, or even when you're like 50 or 100, you know, one of your biggest challenges is going to be, how do you take that team and in say a year or two years, make it dramatically better at everything? Everything you're doing, you need to get better at it. And so that means finding other people who are better than you in a bunch of different vectors. And, and so at that point is when you can start specializing, right? So you might not get people that are, you know, maybe as have as much breadth or, or as generalist as maybe the, the smaller team needs to be. But on the whole, the whole system kind of gets dramatically better at, at tackling most challenges that you'll face. So yeah, that's kind of how we've dealt with it. Cool. Yeah, no, I'm excited to see, you know, what else you guys will all produce because, you know, as as you both pointed out, there's been already quite a few different things. Our friends over at Algorand are starting an office hour series. So every week or two, Algorand will bring together their team, partners, and community together for a live discussion intended to provide you with all the answers and resources you need towards building useful, meaningful blockchain applications. By joining Office Hours, you'll learn how to get started with command line tools and use the SDK and REST APIs to help you build applications for use cases like crowdfunding, asset tokenization, supply chain management, and gaming applications. Each Office Hour will start with a theme, for example, smart contracts or writing contracts in Python, followed by an open Q&A and chat. So if you're building on a blockchain protocol that has unfeasibly high or unpredictable transaction fees and doesn't provide you the speed you need, Or if you work at a large enterprise or financial institution and are interested in learning how to build applications that can integrate with your current technology stack, or whether you have no blockchain experience at all and are just looking to take the first step into learning something new, Algorand could be the right solution for you. 
To learn more, visit algorand.com slash epicenter for developer resources and information about their next office hours. We'd like to thank Algorand for their support of the podcast. I would say let's dive a bit into the meat of our conversation. And, you know, we want to focus a, a lot on Filecoin. Now, of course, Filecoin is very much also related to uh, IPFS. So I don't know if you, if you have to give kind of like an introduction of like what is Filecoin I don't know, maybe does it make sense to first start with like, what is IPFS? Or like, how, how do you tackle kind of that question? We've gotten good at describing Filecoin without having to assume that you know what IPFS is. So, but maybe I'll describe both for, for just for the audience here. So um, IPFS, it stands for the Interplanetary File System. And it's a protocol to make the web peer-to-peer. It, the goal there is to use content addressing to address and move around all the content on the web. So that means files, websites, all kinds of media, instead of using HTTP, which is a location-oriented protocol, um, moving to using IPFS, which is a content-addressed uh, oriented protocol. So that means hash link everything or use name systems that map to hash links um, so you can distribute everything with the same kind of integrity that the blockchains or Git have. Right. So you, you get to turn individual websites into the same kind, having the same kind of integrity as as Git or or blockchains and so on. Right, and and maybe maybe I can briefly explain like an example that might make this easy to understand. Right, where we're seeing IPFS used here today. So you know, as an example, right, like in Cosmos, uh, you have like an on-chain governance systems, and then people make proposals, and then people often like link to like you know the voting takes place on the blockchain. But then often you link to some kind of document, right, that describes the proposal in more detail. And that's always, always hosted in IPFS. And of course, that means because the link defines exactly the document, like anybody can host it and anybody can kind of like surf that document. So you don't have the single point of failure there. And also the link that's on chain, you know, exactly defines the document. So you, you don't have to trust someone, you know, if you, if you put a simple URL, you trust whoever's hosting that website and they could potentially give you something else and then you're reading something else and you're voting on. So IPFS is like a, you know, a perfect solution for this problem. Yeah, and, we, and we, um, we think that the whole way that we move information around right now is, is, is pretty broken because this location addressing makes information too dynamic and too liable to change or, or disappear, right? So if you see a URL, like a normal URL, um, you have no guarantee that what lies behind that URL is the same thing that you, you know the person who sent you the link intended you to, to look at, and you have no guarantee that it's going to be stable at all, right? And so, having at least the the ability to uh, create immutable structures for information uh, is going to be a really critical component for computing. And then beyond that, you can you can then build dynamic systems and dynamic applications on top of that immutable kind of, uh, log of log of versions. So yeah, again, it's it's very uh, kind of Git inspired and and blockchain inspired, and and that's kind of the the way that you know, IPFS as a project has come to you know help out with all kinds of information distribution. Uh, but one of the key parts of the protocol that it didn't uh, address is uh, you know how do you and, and this is an intentional division. How do you get people to store the content uh, in the long term, right? So as a protocol, IPFS is pretty general. Uh, it just says if you are willing to move around the content, then you do, and it's, it's sort of um, leaves it up to the user and to a different layer to decide why you're moving the content. And that's pretty important because people could have tons of reasons for doing this. It could be altruistic, I, or it could be, you know, I want you to look at my data, so I'm totally willing to serve it to you. Or there's a community together uh, forming around keeping some important data sets or some important public data around. Or you could, you know, pay people in euros or dollar, dollars or whatever. And, you know, that was... That was important to separate out from another really important component of a system like this, which is building a cryptocurrency-powered storage network. And so that's where Falcon comes in and, and connects. It's you know now once you have the content addressed by IPFS, then Falcon is is a protocol for uh, you know incentivizing the long-term storage and distribution of that content. So you can pay for it with a cryptocurrency called Falcon. And, uh, and and you can the protocol system is meant to be this two-sided marketplace where on one side parties are bringing in storage and 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 distribution of the data, 
Uh, and so these are the miners. The miners are coming online and providing a lot of storage facilities and and so on. And on the other side are the the clients that want to hire that storage and want to pay people to to distribute the content. And so uh, Falcoin solves the, this kind of market problem by using a currency as a medium of exchange and you know a whole host of protocols to verify the integrity of the data long term, uh, get to you know high reliability, create the kind of in, and set some incentive structures to achieve high reliability in the long term. You know, verify the that uh, that miners are continuing to store all the data and all that kind of stuff. So right now, for example, every 24 hours, all the data storage is proved. So you can tell immediately if somebody stop stop storing something. So you can immediately recover data, right? So people come online into the protocol, take their data, maybe store you know a few different copies, and you can immediately you know over overnight. At any point in time, detect if if uh, people are, have stopped storing that data and then kind of move to repair that that missing copy or, or you know, store it with somebody else and and so on. And you know the protocol itself has very strong incentive structures to you know greatly incentivize miners to continue keeping keeping all the data around in the long term and honoring those deals. You, you get into this is kind of a verifiability property that I was talking about before. Uh, if you today wanted to store data long term in the network, you um, you know outside of the crypto space, you can Hope for the best and hope that altruists are going to keep it, or you hope that um, you can set up, you know, an arrangement with uh, one of the big cloud providers and that you're going to keep paying them, uh, you know, hopefully, and, and, and that that link is going to survive. But if either your bank account or your credit card stop paying, that link will, um, or you know, uh, people stop wanting to store that that data, that link will go away. And so it's an important thing to to establish into the network that you can build a, a network where you can set up very long-term oriented deals for persisting super valuable, super important data in the long term. And that, that only requires cryptocurrency. It doesn't require a bank account. It doesn't require a credit card. It doesn't require you to be, doesn't even require you to be a human, right? So you can think of programs themselves hiring storage on their, their um, for whatever it is they're trying to do, right? And so you can think of smart contracts as being able to use this storage platform. So we'll talk about what happens under the hood of Filecoin in a bit, um, but basically zooming out um, a little bit, um, Filecoin is its own blockchain, very much like Ethereum, but it's kind of a single use kind of network for storing and distributing content. So how does that change the architecture when looking at the differences between a, a general computation blockchain and um, something that is made for a very specific use case. Yeah, um, yeah, great question. I mean, I think you know today when you build a blockchain, you're building you know all of the consensus machinery, and you're building transaction machinery, and you have a currency and so on. So it is it is definitely a superset of Bitcoin, right? So you can use Falcon for everything you could use Bitcoin for, and and more. But you you can't do like general purpose contracts yet. That is intended for the long term. So it is pretty important. It's pretty clear now that we need a pretty generic contract system, even in the world of just kind of thinking about uh, file storage, because you want to enable users to create many uh, kinds of structures for their for either on the client side when they're trying to hire higher storage, or on the on the minor side, think of different kinds of financial instruments being created or or. Um, Economic arrangements between miners and and uh, and their communities and so on, um, and also think about all the applications that people are going to want to build and want to map against the storage. So we're definitely thinking of the whole application stack, um, but we are much more connectivity oriented than most blockchains, right? I think right today we have a lot of islands being formed that are sort of a consequence of the fact that you know blockchain formats are different and consensus. Uh, there's a lot of experimentation with consensus, and that ends up yielding different, all, yeah, all these different blockchains that don't speak to each other that much. And that has yielded a world where you need to create an entirely different set of pro projects and protocols to sort of interconnect them, right? It, it is totally what was going on in the internet before um, before the internet itself was, was coming online, which is people were experimenting a lot with networks, and they were building different networks, and there were a lot of sp specific protocols built on a lot of different wires even and different device devices to to speak to each other and so on and you ended up with like a you know it's a, this is about 
a decade of work where tons of people ended up with many different computer networks around the world that didn't really talk to each other. Uh, and so people ended up having multiple terminals. And then people had to go through the work of interconnecting the whole thing and creating the internet. And we're about to kind of hit that stage, right? There's already kind of a few projects that are that are doing this. But what I what I think is more uh, likely to happen here is that we're going to end up unbundling money, many of the blockchains themselves and separating the layers. I think today it is surprisingly difficult to build an entire system that has very few assumptions and, and very little reliance on other systems and manages to build a, a, a solid uh, crypto economy. Meaning, you know, kind of the original intention for Falcon was that it was just going to uh, work on top of Ethereum and it was going to, you know, for, for a period of time, we, we explored doing this where we could just write entirely on top of Ethereum 1 and either have a set of com- contracts within the chain and then separately having kind of like a virtual chain on top. But we ended up in a, in a, in a world of a struggle because A, the, the throughput would be, ended up, our calculations just exceeded Ethereum's total bandwidth. And like, that's, you know, one problem, kind of hard problem to deal with. Uh, and then another problem was that it was very easy to come up with structures where if you have one system writing on another system like that, you could start messing with the economy in one layer to affect the economy in the second layer. And it was very difficult to create structures that were resistant against that. And we didn't find really good ways of doing that. So, you know, kind of to put it in terms of today, imagine that you can figure out a way to exploit a network like or an ERC-20 token or something, and then you take a huge flash loan with ETH to, to do that. And then suddenly, like, you know, it's very easy to kind of manipulate the incentive structures and mechanisms within one, one network writing on another. And so you have like this crazy combinatoric explosion of mechanisms when, when everything is kind of in the same in the same medium. So kind of in the for you know kind of in, in order to kind of like sort of mount these problems and kind of look ahead, we ended up having to build our own entire chain, like an, our layer one chain from from scratch. And you know that was a super useful thing for us because we ended up being able to optimize the hell out of all kinds of things for the use case. Uh, but it's also super wasteful, right? Because who needs another layer one blockchain, right? Like there's way too many of them. And especially when when we think ahead of, in the future, like there's going to be all kinds of scalability improvements that are going to arrive. And you don't want 50 different teams building 50 different scalable blockchains. You want one or three teams building like really robust systems and getting a ton of input and, and help from a ton of other groups. And you want to arrive at a dramatically better better you know protocol that way. Another way to put it is like you don't want 50 different internets. You want one internet, kind of by definition. So I sort of expect that over time, Falcon and a lot of other blockchains will unbundle and, and end up with like a different kind of layering. But that's probably many, many years out because there's a lot of tech that needs to improve and a lot of protocols that need to be built to address those problems I mentioned, which is how do you get scalability across this wide array of systems? And how do you decouple the mechanisms such that you can have high certainty that you can isolate the the economic effects of one, and you aren't accidentally kind of bundling in bundling them into others. But in the meantime, that means there's a lot of work to do to have a whole contract platform on Falcon, which is kind of like ongoing work that that will land in the future. Plus, build bridges to every other you know every other major blockchain. We we want to be able to have make it easy for contracts on Ethereum to hire Falcon storage like directly and natively within Ethereum without having to think about having to have an application outside that does anything com- complex, right? Like ideally you want, you just kind of call Falcon within the, e- the EVM. And so like, there'll be a set of contracts within Ethereum that then set things up so, such that the Falcon network can then operate in this. And so that means there's a bridge there, but now we have to do bridges across a whole bunch of different different networks and blockchains. And yeah, super wasteful. But I think in the, in the long term, it's good now because it lets all the teams kind of explore this, the, this very rich design space figure out what the right structures are. And there's going to be a very large period of convergence that's coming ahead where a lot of these tech stacks are going to merge. And I think, you know, there'll, there'll definitely be a lot of random protocols that, you know, persist and continue, right? Like today you can, you can still find Gopher websites, right? And like, who uses Gopher? Like, almost nobody. Everybody uses HTTP, right? Like, that's two examples of two. And, and even those two were late stage hypertext systems. There were a bunch of hypertext systems before that kind of led to the development of the web. And so likewise here, I think, uh, you know, we ended up build, building an entire blockchain from scratch. There's a lot of important uh, decisions that kind of led to it. And 
a lot of utility that we get about it in the short term, but I, but in the long term, a lot of these systems will, will end up converging. I don't know if I answered your question. I guess your question was like, what, what optimizations you get to, and maybe I can describe some of that. Like, uh, we get to really make sure that like blocks are as full with the with the you know key component proofs uh, that we need uh, as possible, and they, you know that we aren't rate limiting the growth of the network because it all, it's also carrying a bunch of transaction uh, traffic for a lot of other things. But you know it, it does have like a full you know full ability to you know have any transactions and Falcon as a currency can be can be used and you can. It's already wrapped Filecoin in Ethereum, so you can now move around Filecoin in Ethereum as well and have it participate in a bunch of other DeFi use cases there and then make, make its way back to uh, to the Filecoin chain. Yeah, I don't know if that's useful. Uh, one other thing maybe that, that, was, that is valuable is um, we got to build this entire blockchain with kind of IPLD primitives from the get-go, which means it's very easy to move around IPFS itself. So you can t- take the entire... Filecoin blockchain and the state tree and the blocks and all of the artifacts and move them around IPFS and traverse them with IPLD as you would anything else. And like that's a super, super powerful primitive. So a lot of magic that comes out of that that's probably not going to be apparent for a lot of people for a while. But that's kind of like a super, super high utility thing that comes from our work on IPFS and our work of thinking through data structures there and saying, hey, when you're building a blockchain from scratch, don't create a bunch of like random uh, formats that are really hard to use and so on, like try and make it definitely compact, but but web first and make it easy for for compatibility with a bunch of other systems. And so that's been maybe something useful like that dropped out of that. Cool. No, I think that was really cool to hear like some of you thinking around this, yeah, the Filecoin blockchain. Now, a related question here is, I mean, Filecoin, okay, it's a layer one chain, as you point out, but it's also so, like a very different layer one chain, right? Because you have these miners that are storing, uh, you know, storing data sets and like distributing serving data sets. But, you know, normally you have maybe a miner or a validator and they're all kind of doing the same thing. But here you have, you know, you have different miners storing different data sets. So like, can you explain like, what are the major differences in terms of like how the Filecoin blockchain is sort of you know built and designed you know as a result of the the file storing function it performs versus you know other layer one blockchains? Yeah, so I think maybe the biggest and most important piece is that the proof of work function is a you know proof of useful storage function as opposed to uh, you know normal hashing hash rate oriented. Uh, work. Yeah, th- this is like the one of the highest utility things here, which is, and, and we really hope that other blockchains start doing this, which is instead of using what is a super wa- wasteful proof of work uh, of just kind of like hashing a bunch of random uh, randomness to kind of try and produce a, like, you know, the right value and kind of win the block and whatnot, instead do a, try to do, you know, do, do useful work in that computation, and there's a ton of protocols that have tried to do this in the past. Um, it was kind of like a like a a big challenge for us to try and do it with by producing kind of as a byproduct have that work function produce useful storage, and that's one of the kind of really important differentiators where this as a layer one blockchain has you know, all of the work and effort that goes into maintaining the consensus of the protocol is there's a bunch of useful storage backing that helping back that consensus up. Uh, there's also elements of kind of proof of stake here, wh- where it's kind of like a, a little bit of a mix of both. Uh, we ended up with a kind of like this uh, sort of hybrid protocol where the kind of uh, useful storage sort of catches up over time, and for a, a section of the of the protocol, is sort of uh, the stake that miners have and might lose uh, for kind of consensus consensus attacks and and so on. And this has been like a super super useful component because you know kind of what, what I think is the most important graph in the entire crypto space. Is the hash rate of Bitcoin? I think like that is, and, and has been kind of like this astonishing graph over time. Like I don't know what it is right now. I'm gonna look it up. You know, it's been it's always kind of astonishing to see just like the the ridiculous growth in the hash rate. So this is this is like insane. I don't know if it's true, but this graph claims that we're like close to 150 exa hashes per second. It's an astonishing amount of hashes, an astonishing amount of electricity. And you know, one of my favorite things to do is like plot this graph from up. From, of all times from, you know, 20, 2008 to now and just see like this insane exponential that is totally relentless, right? So 
you can one of the few things you can guarantee about the entire crypto space is that the Bitcoin hash rate, you know, in the, in a larger scale over the multiple years time scale, is going to continue growing exponentially, and it is super crazy. And it's you know I, I don't know what uh, what com- size comparison to a country it, it is now, but you know last time I did this calculation, which was I think like two or three years ago, it was you know was surpassing Australia, and like that's you know and it's grown exponentially since then. So I don't know maybe it's like getting close to China or something like that. Like it's just an enormous amount of power that's going into one single process. And the reason why I think this this, uh, this graph is so important is that it shows the the tremendous power of an incentive structure. And in here, there's a very simple game where a lot of miners are competing with each other to win the next block. And all they need to do is get a little bit more power than each other to increase their likelihood of winning the block. And out of that very simple structure, you end up producing this insane, insanely huge and powerful computing network. And so this is what uh, what Falcon, this is kind of like one of the secret ingredients to, well, not secret, but like totally obvious uh, ingredients to Falcon, which is you want to create this this structure with this kind of an incentive structure, couple it to the block reward, so that, and this is where kind of like the proof of useful work consensus comes in. You have to like land all of that work in order to, to do this, at least in kind of like the original framings. Uh, and you end up with like this, you, you can produce this kind of amazing exponential growth for for the adding of resources to to a network, right? And so this is what, you know, what's kind of like behind Falcon. In fact, Falcon right now, unfortunately, is like rate limited by the blockchain bandwidth. So you, even though it just launched, we're already now rate limited by like the growth of, of the capacity of the network is now rate limited by the, the chain bandwidth. And uh, that, that kind of sucks. We got to get to scalability a lot sooner than expected. I mean, it's a really great place to be. Like we just passed an exabyte. Uh, and like that's a staggering amount of scale. Uh, like when you think about that kind of side, yeah, so, so go, going back to kind of why, why this graph is so important. Uh, when I first saw this graph and I saw the power behind it, you know, I kind of realized that you could use this kind of simple incentive structure to amass any kind of resource on a broader network and then kind of then use that resource to provide some useful service. And so that means you can do this to storage, you can do this to computing, you can do this to bandwidth, you can do this to a bunch of different things. And so for for us, it was one of the key components for Falcon's design was you got you have to have this right incent, this correct incentive structure where miners are competing with each other to add significant capacity to the network. Now another whole other layer here was how do you turn that capacity into you know a very strong incentive to, to store really valuable and useful data? There's a whole world of other you know, mechanisms I won't, won't get into at the moment to really make sure that that's like actually useful, valuable data versus kind of you know, garbage data or something like that. But uh, yeah, this is uh, one of the maybe important components that differentiates Falcon as a layer one blockchain is the use of you know, proof of useful storage to, to maintain the consensus and earn the block reward and get this you know, massive, like really large capacity of you know, really, really large amount of, of data for, for them you know, using to store all the, all the stuff that we want on Web3. Funny thing about scale here, by our calculation, most of Web3 storage is you know, a few petabytes. And so, you know, we can, store, we can store all of that hundreds of times over. And so now we have like this massive amount of capacity. And now like all of the interesting use cases that, that can fill it up and we can turn that capacity to go after uh, kind of like more traditional Web2 oriented uh, problems and businesses and so on, where, you know, like, like now now go and, and, and make this a, a really useful network, not just for the Web3 landscape, but for a bunch of applications that, now can turn around and, and use super useful, cheap storage. Can I ask about the differences in consensus mechanism between proof of work blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum One and Filecoin? Because I mean, so basically, this is just a fairly random thought. Um, but you were talking about how the hash rate of Bitcoin has gone up exponentially. And I mean, in part, that is because um, computation is getting cheaper. But in the most part, it's actually because people have just added resources to this. And if you look at storage, so basically, if you look at computation, we're pretty much at the limit of what is possible. I mean, obviously, you can you can redesign circuits and so on. But, you know, from a physics perspective, um, the MOSFET is probably as small as it's going to be. Whereas if you look at storage, you have so many orders of magnitude that you know you can you can still get to building storage has gotten exponentially cheaper and will 
get exponentially cheaper for the foreseeable future. Does this have any repercussions on um, on the Filecoin blockchain consensus system? Well, so there's a couple couple pieces here. So one is the importance of the mechanism. I think is is that you can convince a lot of people to add resources to one network. So I don't think that the Bitcoin hash rate has actually put a dent into accelerating Moore's law, for example. Like I like I think, and you know Moore's law is already you know we're we're at the very limits, and now Moore's law is about or or you know, pseudo Moore's law, not really Moore's law, is about increasing, you know, continuing the cost reductions by getting you know, many different chips to to talk to each other, like many, many different kind of, we're going towards parallelism, not kind of smaller and smaller transistor sizes. And so the the kind of like scalability will come from better low level ways of, of computing in, in, in these parallelizable, parallelizable systems, right? So things like GPUs and TPUs and all that kind of stuff is, is, is a, I think, kind of like where the frontier lies. To your point, you know, when Bitcoin really kicked off into gear, you know, it's exponential caught up with more with kind of like the normal computing improvement rate. And then after that, just followed it. It didn't really push it forward. Right. So I think I don't think people working on Bitcoin are helping fund drive fundamental improvements. What they may be doing is helping drive fundamental improvements for ASIC design for hash rates, which is like not the most useful thing in the world. You know, maybe useful, but like not that useful. So that's a thing where if you if you change the incentive structure here, where in order to get a you know an advantage over anybody else, you really do provide something some like you know vastly useful resource, and then that can be that can be pretty pretty important, and that's one of the kind of important design considerations. So to, to your question around like, hey, is the work on Filecoin going to push on storage, and because storage is further away from the theoretical limits, might we actually get miners and other groups pushing and advancing the state of the art in storage technology then would like it kind of be meaningful or it could potentially present a risk like like you know what happens if somebody does this in secret and like you know gets like this, this breakthrough storage device that uh, can outpace everybody else i think right now attacking any kind of consensus protocol by trying to find a lot more resources this way and then try trying to like turn that into a business is it, not like the kind of resources that you need to send the many billions of dollars of R and not only R and D but in, in in doing like the the scale of manufacturing to be able to like if you can't come up with a breakthrough device that could store things at a you know maybe maybe 10x or 100x better price point than the rest of the industry as you uh, you probably have invested billions of dollars into doing that and the only way you're going to get your billions of dollars out safely is by you can probably end up mining Falcon with that or you're probably just going to sell it to everybody else. What is most likely is that you're going to set up a storage media company and you're going to sell it to everybody. And and the reason why I don't think it's going to any kind of um, consensus attack is is really viable here is that by the time you get into the tens of billions of dollars of investment into something like this, marshalling that kind of resource and then betting it all on the fact that a consensus attack might net you a benefit is super sketchy. Like there there is very few ways of trying to do a double spend with a large enough quantity of any cryptocurrency, say Bitcoin or, or anything like that, and try to then somehow get away with it. Getting away with it includes having to clear those transactions into other currencies that are not traceable, where other people are not going to find you and so on. So that, you know, these kinds of consensus attacks at this scale is, I think, infeasible. Like it's just straight up infeasible for, for humanity to, to perform. I think it is feasible when networks are a lot smaller. If it, if it only takes a few million dollars to mount these kinds of consensus attacks, totally. That at that point it becomes viable, and then you can trade, you know, using DeFi rails into you know Zcash or your favorite private token, and and so on, and kind of get away with it that way. But you really need to cut down the cost of the attack to millions of dollars or tens of millions at most. Uh, any anything larger than that, and your risk profile just turns into hey, make a business, like become a useful miner, or you know, sell it to other miners. Like, why not? Like that. That's like a much safer path pathway to, to uh, to success. And you, you tend to find that like once you reach those higher amounts of capital in the world, it tends to be pretty short term oriented and pretty rational. And and if the rational incentives line up, then you won't get like this irrational attack attack factor. And and so the not outpacing like the 
like the investment amount to attack needs to not get too far away decoupled from the total value of the currency. Maybe, maybe that's a good way of thinking about it. Sorry, it's a random tangent. <laughs> This is really cool exploration. And like one question that kind of comes up for me. So, I mean, it was interesting you brought up, you know, this like useful proof of work, right? Because as, as you pointed out, right, in the past, there, there were various ideas in that direction. So this was like 2013 and like even earlier, there was ideas like, you know, prime coin where you would try to, you know, find new prime numbers. And then the idea was like, well, this has like some kind of utility uh, as opposed to Bitcoin. But of course, you still have the fact that, like, let's say, Prime Coin became like very valuable. Then maybe a lot of people would uh, expend like a lot of energy into like finding new Prime numbers, and you know, there may be some utility, but it might be very much, you know, from a social perspective, it might be very much like out of line. So I'm curious here. You know, already Filecoin is actually very valuable, right? The price is very high, and if you sort of took like the total supply of Filecoin that will exist, and you know the current price of Filecoin, then you're, I think, like number three on the market cap. So that's sort of assuming, so Filecoin has a very slow release rate. It's not going to, you know, it has like a half-life of six years plus the baseline. So we won't get to even, you know, half of that for the next six to eight years, half of that supply. Plus you then have to think about in six to eight years, where are all of those other currencies that you're kind of comparing against? Going sure, to be, right? sure. So look back to Ethereum. What was Ethereum worth six years ago? And it's like, well, zero. And like, it's worth like, you know, X now. Yeah. What is Ethereum's growth rate going to be? And then map it to that. So like, that's like the fair. And other people right now are just like taking a supply because that's like, that's like a very easy competition to. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I totally accept your point. Yeah. I mean, that was, it's not so much my point. Like, I think the, the, the point I want to make or the kind of question I have is, you know, is, is there going to be kind of like an alignment like, I totally get, like, Filecoin will probably, like, increase the amount of investment potentially in, like, you know, how to store files efficiently uh, and distribute them. And that seems to be, like, you know, a socially good thing. But I'm wondering, like, you know, do you think this, is there, like, a risk that, for example, Filecoin would be so successful that there would be, like, so much invested in that that it's kind of, like, you know, more than socially optimal? Oh, you mean, like, um, if the amount that's going into producing storage for the network greatly outpaced humanity's need for that storage. You're basically saying, hey, so what, like, there's like a lot of value here. And then suddenly the utility of having all of this storage is like not actually useful to humanity. And that's a market question. So, and, and that's a really solid one because, well, a couple of assumptions. One is, um, you know, what is the growth rate of human usage of data? And like, that's growing exponentially, right? It's like, the data generated is like in those, gonna be in the zettabytes soon, and uh, we actually don't have enough storage to store it. So most of the data in the world generated gets deleted. You can maybe say most of the data in the world generated doesn't need to be kept around, but it is kind of one of these like almost you know classic business school style uh, disruptive innovations where you greatly reduce the cost of something and you and you create a you know great capacity of something, and suddenly it starts getting used in a bunch of ways that before was way too expensive to do. So this happened to coal and a number of other other kinds of resources. And so if we can, you know, we're very far away from, you know, one exabyte is a lot and like starts be, being, you know, finally, you know, it, it's kind of amazing to hit one exabyte because that's like suddenly competitive with the large cloud providers. We we, we didn't kind of expect to be the, here so fast. Like we sort of, you know, hey, if we hit 100 petabytes, it's going to be awesome. And like, you know, we're, we already had an exabyte and we're like, oh, oh wow, like that's, Super fast, awesome! Like that, that's a really great result. But we're still kind of really far away from a zettabyte. A zettabyte is a lot, and so um, we we are very far away from matching humanity's consumption. And humanity's consumption is growing way more than our storage media is is capable of dealing with. So I don't think we'll ever really have as much storage media as we really want to have. And and because storage media is not just about storing bits, right? Like you can store bits into all kinds of systems that might be really cheap, like DNA and so on. You want storage media that has certain kind of read-write cost profile and, and latency profile. And so there's only so many hard drives and SSDs in the world. So part of what's going on with uh, storage media is that um, storage media is kind of far away from its fundamental limits, not because you know people are working really fast and haven't hit the limit, but rather because we sort of stopped investing as much in hard drives. So if you look at the, the there's like this really cool graph similar to Moore's law called Kreider's law, 
uh, which tracks kind of like the the density of storage versus the the cost reductions, right? And it can sort of see where it goes. And it sort of tapered off in the last five or so years. It's no longer growing exponentially. And part of the reason for that is not that people are stopping to research storage media or have hit fundamental limits. It's that people are transitioning from hard drives to other media. So now a lot of the R&D budget in the world is going to SSDs and flash and a bunch of other storage media that is um, faster in various ways, you know, or NV, uh, NVMe and, and all this kind of this kind of stuff, where it's different tiers of storage for different kinds of applications, and it just gives you a different performance profile. So different from chips where you can just focus on transistor count, here like the you have multiple variables to optimize, and so you end up with like different tiers. And so I don't know when we'll hit the fundamental limits on on any of them, but uh, you know, for now, Falcon is sort of geared towards the hard drive SSD world. A lot of miners are using SSDs, a lot of miners are using hard drives, and that's kind of like a sweet spot. In the future, uh, you know, we've already thought a lot about how to bring online like the ability to choose the storage media. Like when you're making a deal, you're actually, imagine being able to select, I want this on this type of storage media, so that you can kind of get guarantees about the latency and so on for, for retrieval and, and all that kind of stuff. But that's kind of like longer term work. That's, it's hard enough already to get like the incentive structures to produce uh, this output. Um, that is going to, getting verifiability on that other kind of storage media will require a bunch of technological improvements. But, you know, returning to your question, like I, I don't think we'll ever really outpace humanity's need for data storage. The more data storage capacity we have, we'll, we'll be able to kind of like cut into all of that data that we delete today. And maybe someday we'll come up with more uses for data storage. You know, I think Bitcoin ends up being a waste because nobody can use these hash rate, right? Like this hash rate is totally wasted. And so when you look at the Bitcoin enterprise, it's a lot of hashing machines doing nothing but dissipating energy. And like that is horribly wasteful. But if you can turn that kind of mechanism into producing a useful resource, like that becomes, uh, I think, pretty interesting and valuable. And, you know, like you're saying, as long as it doesn't kind of outpace the you know, human demand, like I think it's a, an important piece. Um, one other point here is like, this actually decoupled from the, price of the token in an important way, meaning it's a market. Uh, at the end of the day, like a Falcon doesn't guarantee a certain amount of storage. It's miners are selling you storage at a price that they set. And and so the, the, the Falcon price kind of floats. There's a coupling and, and a relation when it comes to the fee structures. There's a bunch of fee structures in the network that are denominated in Falcon, and that kind of ends up producing a link there. But it's not about kind of like the, the total amount of storage or something like that. Cool. So... You mentioned a bunch of impacts, right, that Filecoin has. So, so first of all, this aspect that, okay, you have maybe different type of verifiability, you know, this idea that, okay, machines could buy storage. And then we have also hopefully the impact, right, of Filecoin will be that storage will just become like much cheaper and maybe more abundant. So if you, if you kind of take, you know, those things together and... Let's assume that Filecoin, you know, really succeeds at like a huge scale in the next, you know, decade. You know, how will that change the world? Like, what do you think are the most important impacts it will have? Yeah. So I think, you know, kind of maybe I'll describe this in, in uh, short, medium and long term. Right. So in the short term, already with, you know, Filecoin today, as you can use it now and with the capacity that it has now, with the miner set that you have now, you can start taking all of these Web3 applications that right now link content uh, to IPFS and so on and then back up all of them in, in Falcon. So you now have a fully crypto-native, Web3 native way of storing and distributing those applications. So today, a bunch of them end up using Amazon or, or Azure and other systems behind the scenes uh, in order to pin their IPFS data, right? So, so maybe the, the front end is decentralized, but not fully. There's a few applications out there that, that, do, that are kind of fully decentralized that, um, that kind of like nobody is necessarily pinning other than kind of the community members. And uh, Frederick will probably jump in and talk about one in a moment. And, and definitely there are other other storage networks in crypto that you know kind of couple with IPFS and you can use them already. But I think one of the, the kind of important improvements here is you can now start addressing large amounts of data, like really getting into petabytes of stuff and use that in Web3 applications uh, in a way that you couldn't really do before, right? So, so today uh, you can now build something like a social network and build it on tooling like, you know, textiles tooling. I don't know if you're familiar with textile, but it's like a really useful uh, tooling for uh, building Web3 applications. 
and you can build a you know something like a social network or a video oriented website or something like that, like a totally traditional consumer application uh, type thing, and deploy it in a fully crypto native, Web three native way, where the whole application, like not just the front end, but like the logic itself and all the data that users are going to generate, all of that gets backed up and stored using crypto. And that becomes that kind of opens the doors for a lot of things that up until now weren't really weren't really possible, weren't really done that much. Where you know there's all this kind of hybrid app, app stuff where some of it is on using blockchains, a lot of it is still using the normal cloud, and it creates this like really wonky lopsided structure because a bunch of the important facilities are still happening in the kind of locked down cloud, and it makes it. Imp- creates this very large dependence on those development teams. Those development teams still have to run that infrastructure, still have to exist, still have to kind of like have a bank account connected to Amazon. And ideally, you want a system where a developer can build an application, give it to the world, and then users move their application storage and wherever they want, and they can control where that where that storage goes, right? So the, both the, most of your web experience a world where Developers don't have control over your individual data and, and can't decrypt it, can't see it, and so on. But rather, you control exactly where that gets stored, and you control kind of the outcome in the long term of, of that data. And the application developers can move more towards building the UI and developing it and, and shipping it out there, but not really banking on creating a data monopoly that then becomes exploitative of the data. Right. So like it's really kind of breaking that break, breaking that paradigm, and you can make it possible because. A lot of application developers never really want to go into storing people's data or, or looking at it and kind of like trying to ex- exploit using advertising or something like that. They really just want to find a really good way to monetize building the application itself so they can kind of continue doing so. And ideally, they don't want to pay any of the infrastructure costs that it takes to run an application. Most developers are forced into advertising because they end up accumulating. In, in order to run the application, they end up accumulating these huge infrastructure bills and so the way to pay these huge infrastructure bills and all of the engineering talent and effort that goes into maintaining the infrastructure, which is you know sizable a number of people, all of that then suddenly is like, okay, well, you know, advertising model, like, screw it, let's do that. When in reality, like you could move more to a model closer to the app, the kind of mobile app stores where there's a ton of apps that are just developed by app, by developers released into the world and don't have any kind of long-term relationship between the developer and the user um, and no kind of like data ownership problem there. And so like that's one of the things that I think we can achieve in the short term. It's like start moving, making it possible for application developers to build a consumer oriented applications like social applications and video and all that kind of stuff that are fully Web3 native that can start pushing the kind of storage frontier to a world where you know users can have full control of their data and kind of can direct where, the, where it gets stored. And so on. And that's something kind of like possible now. Uh, it's also possible to store large data commons. So this is kind of an, another neat use case where there's a lot of public data out there that today gets uh, somebody has to foot the bill for and somebody has to kind of agree to be the steward for. And they have to sign up to either store themselves in their own infrastructure or hire a cloud to do. And in reality, it's a community-oriented data set. Like, there's a lot of people that care about it. There's a lot of people that want to store it. Or there's a lot of people that want to, this thing to exist and are willing to pay for it. But today, the current infrastructure of computing forces there to be an organization that kind of has to steward the data. Ideally, you can be in a world where you can just, as an individual or an organization, create or publish data. And once you've published it, that, that's it. Like, that's, that's your, the end of your relationship with the, with the data or with a, with a community. And if people want to keep it around, they can pay for it, and they can pay kind of like a like a pool of resources can come together around against that data set. So think of now building a sort of public record of really important data that, that should be kept around by a lot of people, and this could be different kinds of data sets, or it could be all one big kind of public record. You can now build data a data commons that's really a commons where people are contributing resources to keep it around by individually paying the the people that are actually kind of storing that data, like the, the miners and so on, without having to go through a kind of an intermediary steward that that sort of is on the hook for maintaining maintaining this data set. So it's a really important distinction because it means that you can have content address data that's on the network that nobody owns, that anybody can use. And like that's that's something that 
doesn't really exist today because most data has a URL and a URL means a domain and a domain means an authority and an authority means an entity. A legally recognizable entity sort of owns the data and, and creating an avenue for exabytes of data to be uh, you know, fully in the public domain and fully not owned by anybody. Like that, that's something that I think wasn't really possible before and it's now possible today. How people will use this uh, uh, will, or how people, will, what kind of data commons will exist and what time scale we'll see. Like it always takes a, a while to kind of move and rehome, rehome data. But uh, that's one of the kind of like interesting and, and useful, useful things. Kind of more, more midterm and long-term, we really hope that, you know, first we can have a pretty significant impact in, in shifting the, the kind of like rights that people expect out of the computing infrastructure. So that means it should be possible to build applications where the data that you add to the network is really only controlled by you and seen by you and, and decrypted by the people that you choose. And you don't have to worry about, again, developers or other parties uh, spying on it. Uh, but where you can sort of expect that most applications you use follow this paradigm. And today that paradigm is not, kind of exists here and there, but it's a very small minority. And a big part of the reason is the, again, kind of the, that advertising model and, and kind of like the current model of how data gets stored. And so in the medium and long term, it's going to take many years for us to get to this because there's all kinds of important DevX improvements to be made and kind of markets to, to win in and all that kind of stuff. But uh, if we can like have a significant impact into upgrading our computing infrastructure such that most users in the world can sort of expect that when they use an application and they, they type into their phone, that the only people that are looking at that message are themselves and the people they intend to send that message to or share that photo with or whatever. Like that would be a very important kind of contribution to the world. But again, it's like, it turns out to be incredibly difficult to achieve this. And it's a lot about infrastructure, a lot about applications, and it's gonna take a long time. But you know, the first step is making it possible, we're sort of there now. Now winning in, the, in all the important markets, that's kind of like a longer, longer time horizon kind of question. And there's all kinds of like important use cases that, uh, like, like we mentioned before, like having programs that can hire storage for themselves and start, that's kind of like a, a very greenfield avenue where we, we really haven't seen where people are going to build with this kind of stuff. But you can start thinking of full, not just small contracts in kind of today and Ethereum and things like that, but fully fledged applications that are entirely managed by DAOs or aren't even managed by DAOs with people. They're just kind of just entirely programs or like small AIs that are running these things. So imagine if Decentraland was not run or maintained by humans, but it was just kind of like a, a protocol and a system that kind of had its own kind of algorithms for deciding when to store data and what to store where and all that kind of stuff. And that you could sort of design maybe the rules of the protocol, but then it becomes a, yeah, an important infrastructure layer. And then you don't have to like, you know, you don't have to trust humans again to to maintain their their um, the culture of the system in a certain way. You can you can really turn into protocol kind of like IP and require that the rules function in a certain way. You know, some of that kind of becomes possible if you can enable programs to hire vast amounts of storage on their own. And like you know, that's that's sort of like what in the long term I think we can we can achieve. I mean, you can do it right now in smaller scales, but it's going to require you know, to really kind of hit that scale that source of scales and so on. It's going to require a lot of bridges to other applications and and so on. So I think like th that's going to be a bunch of use cases that we can't really predict at the moment, but you can maybe see glimpses of. We've kind of like theorized many different kinds of applications that, that uh, you might build that would be kind of self-replicating in some way or would hire storage in their, on their own and whatnot. And it seems like a pretty exciting exciting field, but it, this is the kind of stuff that once you build it, you then discover all kinds of things that people are now doing with it that you then may not have expected. Good and bad. <laughs> it doesn't end here. There's more to this conversation and you can hear it on Epicenter Premium. As a premium subscriber, you'll get access to a private RSS feed where you can hear the interview debrief and get enhanced features like full episode transcripts and chapters which allow you to easily skip to specific sections of the interview. You'll also get exclusive access to roundtable conversations with Epicenter hosts and bonus content we put out from time to time. Go to premium.epicenter.tv to become a subscriber and support the podcast.